plans. As you can see, we've just started the recording. So if you have, um, by staying on, you agree to being recorded. Um, just let some more people in here. Sorry about that, I can't do two things at once. Um, so before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the country that we all meet on here today um, and pay respect to the traditional custodians and owners of the land um, and pay uh, respect to the elders past, present, emerging. I'm on Wiradjuri country and in their words, Nanana, Yindamara, Yuarli, Nirambangu, to acknowledge, care for, look after and respect country. Now, today is an interesting day. Uh, it's National Ag Day. So as you can see, I've got a little bit of paraphernalia um, behind me. And we thought it was a great way, uh, seeing the theme was innovation, um, to have Colin Sice, the innovator of pasture cropping, come and do a session with us today. Um, I realized that we have a lot of Bob Hawk winners, award winners from Lane Care Australia, in or around our neighborhood or region and thought it a great opportunity to be able to um, promote the great work that these award winners are doing around the area. So right now I'll hand over to Corey Tatz to touch base on a few more things before we um, put call on. Thanks. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Liz, and welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Corrie Tatz. I'm the Regional Land Care Coordinator for Central Tablelands, um, based in Bathurst. And in my other hat, I actually teach transformational change um, in Regen Ag with Southern Cross Uni and Charles Sturt Uni. So I'm absolutely thrilled to be um, inviting and, and sharing this with Liz Davis and you all by um, hearing and um, Cole Sice of his knowledge that he will share with us today. So just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if we can all have our um, mics on mute, all Q&A we'll be looking at throughout the session and Liz will be checking in on that and we'll have a, we can break for Q&A at the end. Um, so please feel free to put your questions into the chat pane. Um, the presentation from Cole will go for about 40 minutes and then we'll have plenty of time uh, for questions thereafter. If you have any burning questions, please raise your hand um, and we can still facilitate that process as well. Um, so just to kick things off as well, it'd be great just to have a bit of an introduction um, from everyone in the room as well. And so as we're going through, if you wanted to pop into the chat pane, just response to some of these questions. So whether you're a member of Landcare, um, whereabouts you reside, um, and in what role. Um, if you wanted to describe Landcare, how could you do that in less than five words? What do you like most about land care? And if you'd like to learn more about land care, get in touch with us and um, we can pop you into contact with your local land care groups. So you don't need to respond to all of these questions, even a couple as we're going through, and um, we can keep a look at that in the chat pane as well. So without further ado, I'd really like to um, introduce Cole um, to you now. He's a Central Tablelands farmer, pioneer, um, in pasture cropping and as Liz has also mentioned a recipient of that Bob Hawke Landcare Award. So Cole over to you we're absolutely thrilled to have you here today. Okay thank you very much I'll start this presentation maybe. Ooh. Hang on I double click that is that working okay or not? Uh, yes, yes, it is working, Cole. But if you, I think up in the top right-hand pane, if you go play from start, that should be able to give us the full screen. Yeah. Um, yeah, I double-clicked it. Hang on, hang on. I'll, I'll start again. Right. Almost there. Okay. Yeah. Right on. 
Now, as as the theme of the the I guess these talks or this talk is thinking here more about planting trees, I'm going to address that. Um, so just to fill you in on where I am and what I do, just quite fairly quickly. Myself and my son Nicholas on property here, property called Winona. Um, and uh, 2,000 acres, central tablelands or uh, uh, north of Goldong actually, north of Mudgee, granite soils and 600 millimetres of annual, annual rainfall. A few different enterprises, mostly we're running merino sheep. Uh, we run about 4,000 merino sheep and have for many years. Um, about a quarter of the place is uh, sown to crops a year, each year, and that's a pasture crop. A couple of other, there's a few other enterprises that we run on the property. Uh, one of them is Moreno, uh, we run a Moreno uh, stud, which my father started in the 1940s, and we saw Kelby dogs all over the world, Australia and the world. But an interesting enterprise, which I'll talk about in more detail, is a, a native grass seed. So, land care is far more than planting trees, but that doesn't mean, doesn't mean we shouldn't be planting some trees. Just wanted to address that uh, to start with, in case some people were getting into a bit of a panic <laughs> about that something wrong with, with trees. But we need to, be, to understand a bit more about that. The property here, just to give you an idea, 2,000 acres, 840 hectares. It is to subdivide into, in, into 75 paddocks, which which been done for, for the grazing enterprise. But uh, about 14% of that is timbered rem, remnants. And we actually have planted a lot of trees here. Um, found over 2,000 local native trees and shrubs. And also about 1,500 paddock trees, single, single paddock trees have been planted for shade and grassland function or, or in, in, in the process of restoring the grassland. The property is 86% is native grassland now. Now, there's a lot of misconceptions uh, and has been for a long time, and I've been addressing this for a long time. Uh, we keep on hearing about Australia was a land of trees. And that's absolutely not true. The, if we look at uh, the early explorers reports and the early settlers reports, they repeatedly talk about grasslands and how magnificent our grasslands were in Australia. Um, and often describe them as, as yes, grassland with scattered trees. Uh, it, was, it was originally called, called a, an open forest, which is exactly that, trees every hundred metres or something like that. And there was definitely areas of Australia that had no trees on them at all. And they were most, most likely, um, certainly the basalt soils, black soils, which didn't support trees really at all. Um, so we need to always understand that it is, it, Australia was, was never fully covered by, by trees, but it, it was a grassland. And the reason we have a grassland is because of our, uh, indigenous people are Aboriginal people that manage for grasslands for many decades, for, for tens of thousands of years. And um, the reason they manage for grasslands is that the grasslands were their main food source. And um, basically it was their supermarket. So now, um, Australia, uh, the, this property here was not always native grassland. It was originally, but it, it wasn't always native grassland. So in the 1860s, the original grassland was very, very high quality, contained over six, 200, and that's possibly higher than that, but 200 to 300 plant species. My great grandparents uh, settled here in the 1860s uh, on, in this area here. So we, we've been here for a long time and, and often some of the longer talks that I do, I talk about how, um, how my, 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 my family, my, my uh, ancestors managed the, the, the properties and, and, um, and uh, 
not a, a, did a lot of good things, but did a lot of did a lot of things that did that turned out to be inappropriate as well. Um, I've just actually written a book which covered all of that, the um, the, the history of, of agriculture in these areas and, and and my part in that. So industrial agriculture was adopted in the 1930s um, by, by my father. I just missed a couple of generations there and he started growing wheat in, in the 19, 1930s. But he, what he did was did a lot of damage to, to our grasslands uh, here on the property. He said about restoring the grassland, or not, not restoring the grasslands, he, he crop, cropped root crops for 20 years straight and destroyed the grasslands and then said about re-sowing uh, pastures. And he adopted the best practice at the time in the 1940s and 1950s. And he sat it down to introduce annual pasture, which was the subclover superphosphate era. Um, he's very much a pioneer in that. But he was uh, fertilizing annually, um, plowing and cultivating, using it. So he was using a lot of fertilizer and, and started using pesticides sort of in the, in the 1970s as well. One thing we need to be aware of is that that high input system was very productive and it was successful in that era. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't, it turned out to be not that successful. I came home from school and continued the destruction of the grass, the, of the grass down on the property with, with uh, um, the practices that my father had started. He was really fortunate, as you can see from that photo on the left there, that I didn't have a very big plow at the time, so otherwise I would have done a lot more damage than I did. So I was a part of, of the uh, destruction of, of, of the property as well. So industrial agriculture was, was turned out to be doing serious damage to the property, to Winona. And, um, and it started to collapse and crash in the 1970s. But those high input methods were really costing us, or actually costing my father really, um, $80,000 annually on today's figures or 2020 figures, uh, costing a lot of money and um, very difficult to justify that form of agriculture now. So by 1970, the Winona grass scene was totally destroyed really, just a few remnant plants were left. Those remnant plants were, were um, uh, I was fortunate that I, there were, were a few remnant plants because that's what I used to build, restore the, build and restore the grassland off. So how and why did I change? During the 1970s, the, the cost of farm inputs becoming that high uh, uh, that it, uh, it was difficult to, to be profitable, even in that era. Um, but in 1979, we had a major bushfire through, through here, which destroyed everything. It was like those serious fires a few years ago uh, in New South Wales here. And um, destroyed homestead, shearing shed, 3,000 sheep, all the buildings, most of the fencing. And we went from sort of going okay to broke really overnight. Um, and how do you get out of that? So I, it was really difficult. There was virtually nothing left on the property. It, it, uh, it was like an atomic bomb went off. Um, and no money at all, like just, just instant broke. And um, so I looked at low input agricultural methods in the 1980s and um, they had to be more than low input. They had to be no input because we had, had no money anyway. So the fertilizer uh, and, and pasture programs that my father started really in the 1950s, I stopped them because simply because you couldn't afford them. Um, I did focus then on 100% ground cover. I was aware of what was happening or what was being done in, in gardens. And um, I started to mimic that. I, I thought if we, if, if we could get enough ground cover, things should work right. I knew it worked in a garden, should work on a property. Unfortunately, we don't do enough of that today uh, on properties around the world. So I adopted holistic land grazing in 1993 and developed pasture cropping 
at this, around about the same time. Combine the two, which would, which really made a big difference in 1995. What I really did in that that time was focused on restoring the property to grassland. The reason that I focused on restoring the property to grassland it was no great philosophical reason, but I knew that the native grass species never ever required fertilizer. After all, they'd been here for millions of years in this country. Certainly didn't require fertilizer a million years ago. So it shouldn't require fertilizer now. So that was why I focused on grasslands. So what I did was I restored the grassland by changing the way I grazed animals and, and the way I grew crops. And now there are over 60 grassland species on the property. How I, how I did it? Well, I changed the grazing management, as I, as I said there be, before. Um, so the way we were grazing animals really with set stock grazing wasn't working. Um, and the, the way, really the way uh, animals were grazed right from my great grandparents' time in the 1860s, right through each, fam each generation really wasn't working. And that was one of, one of the reasons why the grassland not only declined, but uh, then got very poor quality. But the way, way the animals were grazed killed the grasslands, encouraged annual weeds, destroyed the soil ecosystem and destroyed the farm ecosystem. You probably will get sick of me talking about ecosystems by the time this talk's over. But um, ecosystems and restoring ecosystems are the way we can restore our farms and, and, and really this plant of ours as well. So, that form of grazing really, and I won't dwell too much on this slide, but um, creates plants with really short root systems. And that's, a, that's a, a quite a serious problem if, problem if, uh, if that's a permanent thing on properties. So what did I do? In regard to grazing, I reduced the numbers of mobs of sheep, combined sheep into two main mobs, rotated the sheep around the property, and that recre created time for plants to recover. And time is, is the most critical thing in, in, in grazing. If we can create time for, for plants to recover before they're regrazed again, that's what that form of grazing will, will do. So, as I said before, there's two main mobs of, of, of sheep here. There's, a, there's normally about two and a half thousand uh, sheep in, in one mob in there for the adult sheep. I run the younger sheep under one year olds in a separate mob. When we've got cattle, which is very often, um, cattle are included with, with, uh, with the sheep. There's 75 paddocks here now, and generally there is a four month plant recovery time. In other words, four months before the animals, the sheep get back to where they started in the rotation. That's just a photo of uh, <laughs> if you're an indication of the mob size. Although that mob there is about two and a half thousand ewes with their lambs um, that we're, we're taking to the yards to wean the lambs. So there's about 5,000 sheep in that mob, um, which seems quite daunting to manage, but they're actually become quite easy to manage in large mobs. So, by, by having a, a list of grazing management and using a grazing rotation, it will and does encourage perennial uh, 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 grassland species to regenerate. It does discourage annual weeds. It does restore the soil ecosystem. The other thing it does is, is create ground cover if we graze well, it puts litter and mulch on, on the ground soil surface. But some people think this grazing method is new. I, I didn't develop this form, form of grazing. Um, it's certainly not new. And one of the early pioneers of, of rotational grazing was actually a French farmer, scientist called Andre Royston. And But the idea of holistic plant grazing, holistic grazing and holistic management began with Alan Savory in the 1960s. So Alan Rudin is, should be always credited with this form of grazing. So now 
to move on to, to, to crops and, and the way we, we, I, I chose to grow crops here, sort of the way that we were, that we were using or growing, the way we were growing crops uh, with plows, especially plows in early days, and then excessive herbicides and pesticides at a later point, certainly killed the grasslands, um, destroyed the soil ecosystem and destroyed the farm ecosystem. Um, a dish plow is uh, incredibly destructive. Um, it's one of the most destructive things we do. So what did I do in regard to growing crops? Um, I developed a new method of sowing crops in 1993 called pasture cropping. That method of growing crops, which is, is actually zero tilling as, as well, or a different form of zero tilling, will grow high quality crops and it does restore the native grassland. Um, and it does that by stimulating the germination of seed that's in the soil. We'll restore the soil ecosystem and farm ecosystems as well. Um, in 2010, I developed pasture cropping to a bit of a, to another level uh, when I developed multi-species pasture cropping. Now, having more plants in, in a crop uh, does produce excellent livestock forage. Um, and uh, rapid restoration of soil ecosystem and, and, a, and a rapid restoration of farm ecosystem. In other words, that mix of, of, of crops that, or plants, plants that are compatible with each other fast tracks the restoration of, um, of our farms and soil. So pasture growing itself was invented and developed by myself and Daryl Clough in 1993. Uh, and um, that photo actually shows a lot because harvesting an oat crop there and the green it, in, in between the rows is actually summer growing grass that we've sown that crop into um, that then will end up within, within a month, probably a metre high after the crop is, is harvested. What pasture cropping is, is perennial cover cropping. Uh, we're, we're growing annual crops in, with zero tilling annual crops into dormant perennial grass or grassland. Now we're using uh, animals in my case sheep as well. Uh, so if we manage, manage sheep and grow crops, uh, well, we, they will come or can complement each other. In this sense, the um, big mobs of sheep uh, before we sow the crop, pre, pre sowing the crop, not only mulch a lot of the grass onto the soil surface, like, like, like a vegetable garden, but also add a lot of nutrient to that, that paddock before the crop is sown in, in the form of manure and, and urine. Uh, then the crop is sown into that. The, the other benefit that the crop does is restore the soil ecosystem, um, but in particular, it, it restores grassland, encourages the germination of native grass seed that's sitting in the soil and restores grassland. So it's actually the grassland that restores the um, farm and soil ecosystems. This is just a graph um, to demonstrate what we're doing here. That, that's not really how grasslands function. The, the orange line there is how, how our, our uh, warm season uh, grasses grow, perennial or native, native grasses grow. The other blue line is how our cool season grasses grow, but that can also be a wheat crop or an oat crop, cereal crop, or anything that we grow in the winter, really, while those grasses are dormant. So, by growing crops in this manner, and, the, and this has very, been very, very highly researched now, not only here in Australia, but in other countries as well. Um, we can produce crops for grain and or grazing. It will restore grasslands by st stimulating perennial grass species and species diversity, does improve soil health and organic carbon levels as well. So, yeah, after the crops harvested, we, we, we've got our, our grassland intact, which we can graze 
as well. This is just a photo of how we restored the grassland here uh, by using these methods. That's just a couple of photos, uh, same paddock, just six months later in February and then again in August, showing different species, summer species and winter species in the same paddock at the same year. So the restoration of, of the grassland certainly has reduced costs, run more livestock, grown high quality crops, restored the soil and farm ecosystems. And the other thing that's done is, is created a native seed enterprise. I'm going to talk a little bit about the native seed um, enterprise because it is a, an unimportant part of not only our enterprise here, enterprise mixes here, but got a lot of potential into the future. Now that what we do with the seed here, or when we harvest it, it's it's used for revegetation around Australia on 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 farms. It's also used in for re, re, rehabilitating. Um, uh, mine sites and other degraded type areas and road sites and things like that as well. But in the future, it, it will be used again for human consumption. And just to go on from that as well, um, like we harvest two ton, around about two ton of native seed a year. And what's happening now, Sydney University and Humilaroy Aboriginal people, the, the, mostly the, working with the ladies at Narrabri, at Plant Bleeding Institute at Narrabri, the Research Centre Narrabri, which Sydney University have, um, are working with the Aboriginal people there, working out or rediscovering the uses of a lot of our, our native grassland species or seed species. And those loaves of bread there, the Aboriginal ladies bake them from uh, Warrego seed. Uh, and uh, there's, there's a lot happening, in, starting to happen in this space. We still have a long way to go. After all, we've got about 10,000 years to, get, to catch up on. Um, <laughs> so, although uh, if we can learn or rediscover a lot of the, the knowledge that our Aboriginal people had, we can fast track a lot of uh, the work being done with, with these. Uh, seed and, and processing and not only that on on how, how to utilize them and use them as, as a, a human food. Now because I was doing stuff totally differently on the property here uh, <laughs> in early days I was copying a lot of flack from just about everyone that wanted to throw rocks at me. Uh, <laughs> I encouraged a, a lot of research work to be done on the property um, because I started to see things that uh, weren't making sense in regard to conventional agronomic uh, agriculture or conventional industrial agriculture. Um, certainly uh, the restoration of grasslands was one, uh, improved rapid improvement in soils and soil health, all those things were were, were puzzling me. And not only that, I, I thought that it, it, you know, because the results were, were, were that different to conventional agriculture, I thought, no, no one's going to believe this stuff. So I did encourage the um, uh, uh, research work to be done on the property here. So, so what I did on my own, I changed the grazing management to a sick plant grazing in 1993 and changed the way I grew crops. I, but I didn't plant or sow any native, native grass species here. I actually managed for um, those grass species. So what were the results on, on, on Monona? The restoration of the grassland. Um, so the grassland now has increased from 10%. There was, there was only about 10%, uh, very, very few na native plants on the property. Now there's over 80% since 1999, when that was when we start, first started to measure. Increased from nine to 60 species. There's, there's 60 native grassland species here. Still got a fair way to go if I want to get to the 200 species that my great grandparents had in the 1860s. Um, annual weeds have decreased from 60% 
to less than 5% in that time as well. So it's been a very rapid turnaround uh, in, in, in the grassland here. So we haven't used insecticide on the property for over 25 years and have no insect attack in crops or pastures. Now you'd wonder how, like, um, uh, how that's possible, but some work done by university student Elise Wend and Canberra ANU. This is a fair while ago now. It'd be interesting to do these, this result again, or, or check do these measurements again. And Elise Wendon found that insect numbers had increased by 600% on the property and insect diversity had increased by 125%. But we were getting less insect attack in, in uh, our crops and pastures. So, but we've got more insects. How is that possible? So by restoring the farm and, and, and restoring the grassland and the farm ecosystems, we actually can increase insect numbers and do increase insect numbers. Um, so it, it still doesn't answer, that, answer what had happened, but the insect numbers, we were getting a big increase in lady beetles and spiders and predatory wasps on the property. It was those, 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 uh, uh, those spiders and, and predatory insects that were, were managing the crop damaging and the pasture damaging uh, insects. And that allowed us to um, stop using any, any uh, insecticides. So we've also uh, got a very large increase in bird numbers here. And because we'd been here for a long time, I grew up on the property here, I, I knew there was very few birds here. There, there was quite a lot of glass, but there was a lot of sparrows and, and basically introduced birds, which I call weeds. Uh, but because now again, because we'd restored the grassland, now we've got grassland species here, all sorts of birds. Um, so the, the restored grasslands and the tree plantings have contributed to a significant increase um, in, in bird, bird numbers um, and, 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 uh, and diverse species diversity. So we haven't used any uh, uh, pesticides, insect, uh, yeah, yeah, pesticides on crops or parches for fungicides, any of that thing for over 25 years. Um, the reason why that, that it's a bit like the insect world, when we did do a soil uh, uh, microbial test, found that all of the soil microbes have increased enormously. So and it's that uh, functioning soil ecosystem, uh, large diversity of soil microbes that can crop, crop disease and pasture disease and all of those type, types of, of, of diseases. Now, conventional agriculture doesn't seem to realise what's, what's go, going on um, it, 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 with, with a lot of this stuff. So crop and pasture disease, insect attack and declining soil health are symptoms of the way crops and pastures are grown and animals are grazed. So they're only symptoms. It, it, so we get what we manage for. And if we're getting crop disease and insect attack, all of those types of things, it's basically, that's how we're running our properties. We need to do, the, do it differently if we, if we want to get away from those types of, of um, uh, problems. And things like insecticide and, and pest, uh, all those pesticides really don't address the, the problem at all. They're just band-aid things. And uh, we, uh, the only way to fix our problem is to, is to fix the, the ecosystem. Having used fertiliser on pastures for over 42 years and the crop, crop fertiliser has been reduced by 70%. So you'd wonder how that was possible. Um, so restoring the, the soil ecosystem does supply nutrients and minerals to plants. I, I won't go into a lot of detail on this, but things like uh, fungi, in particular mycorrhizal fungi, supply phosphorus, nitrogen, trace elements and water to the plants. Protozoa nematodes eat bacteria and fungi, which supply nitrogen and other nutrients. And we also have free living nitrogen fixing bacteria that supply 
large forms of nitrogen. We don't necessarily need fertilizer. We don't really necessarily even need, need legumes. Nothing, nothing wrong, wrong with legumes, but um, old mother nature is quite amazing. Um, if we give her half a chance, Now, in regard to soil here, the photo there is, is half a metre deep. And the soil on the left is soil, soil on the property here. Just through the fence on neighbouring property is the other sample there. And uh, doing soil tests on, on those two paddocks, actually those two paddocks are probably <laughs> one of the most researched in the country. Um, so, the, the the soil or the paddock that that soil's come from on the left as in as it got 200 percent more organic carbon uh, in the soil and that has sequestered about 60 ton almost 60 ton of, of, of carbon per hectare which equates to 300 ton of carbon dioxide uh, per hectare in other words plants grassland species are removing uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and through that process, storing it in, in the soil uh, as carbon. So the soil on the left also holds 200% more water and um, all the nutrients and trace elements have increased by an average 172% in this paddock. So com compared to the neighbouring paddock, just through the fence again. Um, and the pH has changed from 5.2 to 6.01 uh, with no lime being put on. So given half a chance and, and, and by growing plants, plants are the drivers of everything. Plants are, are, is, is what has created this change in the soil. So the property now sequesters far more that, 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 than it emits. So is it profitable? Yes, it certainly is profitable. Um, one thing that, that uh, I do save now or I don't spend, that $80,000 that, that we used to spend and my father used to spend and I used to spend annually, $80,000, we don't spend now. Um, so we're $80,000 every year before we even start. Um, now that over the years has, has actually been a saving of millions of dollars. I don't know where the millions of dollars went, but it's the um, it, it 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 is uh, very very significant. Now those savings are coming from uh, uh, reduction in or no fer no no fertilizer put on pastures, reduction in fertilizer in crops, reduction in pesticides, and that those fertilizers and pesticides are now being supplied by Mother Nature. Um, insect control coming from predatory insects, um, fertilizer, well, sorry, soil nutrients are, are now being supplied by a functioning soil ecosystem. So that's how you can save a lot of money every year by getting your property functioning in this manner. So what this has done is, is, is actually given us a, a higher income. Uh, we're running more livestock on the property. Uh, we're getting good crop yields and wool quality on, on the sheep is, is far better. It's far better because of the grassland really. And, and, and it's, it's better because the feed throughout the year is far more even. So we harvest and sell over a couple of tonnes of um, native seed a year. Soil carbon levels are increasing. All those soil nutrients are increasing. Uh, with, with all those inputs and less labour as well. Um, so to sum this up really, for 10,000 years, we've killed grasslands and destroyed soil to grow crops and graze animals. The reason we're talking about 10,000 years is um, that's when agriculture started primarily in, 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 uh, in the Middle East and in Mesopotamia. Um, and we adopted all over the world, form of agriculture that was developed then. Uh, that form of agriculture was it was actually developed, uh, adopted by the Egyptians and the Romans, and then into Europe, and then around the world. Um, 
that form of agriculture, which now is industrial agriculture, has, has created um, deserts around the world. So, if we get, if we, we, we get, get it right, um, we can, if we get our farming practices right, um, and agriculture doesn't have to destroy farms and ecosystems and the planet, good agricultural practice can, can produce vast amounts of high quality food. That isn't a problem. It's, it's often been cited as um, uh, one of the problems with this form of, for the want of a better word, regenerative agriculture. How, how are we going to, going to grow high amounts of food? We can certainly grow plenty of food. That isn't a problem with these forms of agriculture. But we can regenerate our grasslands. We, we can restore our farms and soil ecosystems, and we can help restore our ailing planet. Thank you. We can have some questions now, I think. I'll just. Yeah, fantastic, Paul. That was, ah, oh, you could just keep going as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Uh, well done. Um, we do have a question. What species of native seeds do you harvest? Oh, what sort of seed do, do, do uh, I harvest? Yeah. Um, there's three, three or four species of seed here. Um, they, and they're different types. Like, a lot of people assume that native grasses are just those things that get stuck in your socks. So, but, um, and some of them do. Red grass being one, it can get stuck in your socks. Red grass is, is, is um, one species we harvest here. But some of the better uh, agricultural um, species, uh, warrego summer grass and green summer grass, which are little round seeds. Um, and I clean them through a seed cleaner. They, and they can be sown through a normal seed box, like a normal pasture is sown. So a lot of people are now sowing many of those. There's a couple of others. One, one of them is Cotton Panic, which is a digitaria. Um, some weirder ones like Microlina and, and um, uh, common wheat grass as well. Um, but we, we often uh, now I've been trying to get people to sow grassland mixes for quite a while. And now more and more people are doing that as in sowing a mix of species, which is a better way. I uh, can sneeze. <coughs> Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. yeah, that's a far better way of doing it. We should be we should be sowing mixes of, of, of species and and sowing grassland mixes, trying to restore grasslands. Fantastic. Now we've got somebody here that's trialing tomatogenic legume arrow leaf pastures and grazing oats for finishing fat lambs. Can you say that what they are again, the species? I'm probably mispronouncing it. Casey, do you want to hop on and pronounce it? Anti-mitogenic. Can I always use a count on my pronunciation being wrong? And that'd be estrogenic, I think, um, probably, is it? It's a lot of clovers. Some of the older clovers were high, high in estrogen, and that caused a lot of, um, or not a lot, but some uh, 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 animal fertility problems. So I'm assuming that, uh, that that's the case, but I, but I'm, if, if that, that if, if it isn't that, I'm not too sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. It's called the anti-mitogenic legume, arrow leaf pastures. Yeah, no. Okay. Arrow leaf, arrow leaf pasture is fine. Okay. Arrow leaf pasture is fine. The main problem, it's, it's an annual, an annual species. Nothing wrong with arrow leaf clover. Uh, it will grow a huge amount of food, uh, of stock feed, but we need perennials in, in, our, in our pastures, as well as some perennials, annuals. Uh, while ever we're saying only annual species, we'll always get ourselves into droughts. Um, we'll, we will never improve our soils and soil, soil health and never get our farms functioning well. So nothing wrong with our relief clover, but we do need to include other other perennial species in there as well. Yeah, okay. Now we've got one from Claudia McClay asking, um, where do you want to see the farm in 10 years time? The farm here? Yeah. Uh, be, be nice if we could, yeah. 
if, if we could get the species to two or 300 in this grassland, grassland. Um, but it keeps on evolving. It's really quite interesting. Um, uh, it, it keeps on evolving and the grass species keep on increasing uh, and, and diverse, well, grass diversity keeping on increasing. Uh, and yeah, if, if we can get a really good functioning grassland, like this, this grassland is, is quite good now, but even more diversity, it can handle anything. Like we, we worry we, uh, and, and, and should uh, be concerned about climate change and all, all associated with it and droughts and the floods now. But if we have resilience on our farms, which is, I don't I mean, sort of answer the question in this way, if we can, um, more and more resilience, uh, we can handle anything, uh, whatever, whatever is thrown at it. Mother Nature is very clever. In other words, we should be, we should be uh, um, uh, uh, restoring uh, the, the, not only our ecosystem, but it should function in, in, an, in, an, in an, as a nat nat natural way. Oh, Mother Nature was right. Um, and so the closer we get it to, to functioning as a natural system, the more resilience we will get, the more profitable it becomes, everything just falls into place. So what I'm, hope, what I'm hoping 10 or 20 years, 10 years time here, yes, it should continue to increase in profit as we get more species in it. Okay. Uh, Jane Thompson. Hi, Jane. She's asked, what multi-species do you suggest and what did you plant in 2010? Okay. Um, Oh, okay. In 2010, uh, I, I was just started to play around with oats and field peas together, and the field pea climb, will climb up the oat plant. That's where I started from. Um, I, um, in 2010, I, I was in the US doing some talks uh, at conferences and that, and I met uh, fellows like uh, Gabe Brown and David Brandt, Gail Fuller, quite a few of those people that are doing good work there. And they were also about the same, at the same stage as I was uh, at looking at, at, at plants, uh, adding plants to, uh, to more, more, more forage plants. Well, they were working on cover crops. So I was working on, uh, I always already had a cover crop. Mine was perennial, past cropping is actually perennial cover cropping. Um, but anyway, um, so over the years, sharing information between us all, we start to look at more and more and more and more plants in our mixes. Um, and um, so, and, and just a basic mix here, there's only six or seven in it, but a basic mix just off the top of my head with it, with a, a, a multi-species crop. Oats, field peas, vetch, um, uh, what else have we got? Uh, uh, that's an annual vetch. Uh, uh, turnip, Tillage radish or, or daikon radish. Um, one more. Um, you can put lupins in, uh, lentils in. There's there's plenty of other other uh, plenty of things you can put in. Cool. Well then, uh, it's a common conception or misconception. Native grasses are only useful in livestock feeding systems and don't fatten animals. What's your view on this? Okay, it's really interesting. Um, <laughs> I, I, that's a misconception about native, about native grasses. Well, it is, it's, it's partly true, um, but our original grasslands in this country were incredibly, uh, 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 incredibly good, uh, incredibly diverse, and would definitely fatten livestock. And the early, early settlers, the early, uh, yeah, the early settlers described the grasslands on their properties in glowing terms. And, um, uh, and we do have that documented quite well, either from explorers or early settlers, um, and uh, could fatten bullocks on it. They often spoke about uh, how well horses worked off, off uh, our grasslands. Now you gotta remember the people in the, in the early, in the 1800s were, both, were European. So they were used to a European grassland and but they were raving about how good this grassland was in Australia. So it was a good grassland. Over time, what happened was inappropriate grazing or grazing, it, it turned out to be inappropriate, grazing as they knew from Europe, 
really did, did a lot of damage to our grasslands and the animals removed uh, a, lot, a lot of the really high quality uh, species. And as they removed them, because they were set stocked on these paddocks, um, as they removed them, then the poorer quality ones uh, increased in number and got to a point where there are only a few grassland species left of really poor quality. And that's what many people think of as native grassland today. And they'll say, oh, my cows will all just about die on those things. And they're right because <laughs> that they were always a poor quality grass in our original grassland, those ones we've got left. So they're very poor remnants of our original grassland. Right. Um, Corey's put one up. Have you observed other positive animal health impacts as a result of your grazing system? Example, quality of wool, like you mentioned. Yeah. Certainly the quality of wool's increased because we've got very even feed throughout the year. So anyone knowing anything about wool tensile strength, uh, of all the, the fiber, fiber, wool fiber grows very evenly. Uh, interestingly, uh, in a good grassland, there's not many, many species that, that really contaminate wool. In fact, a lot of the species like barley grass and those are actually introduced species, they're not native at all, uh, which contaminate wool. So it gets a bad rap every time. Um, so, and the vegetable matter in our wool here is at, at 0.5, half, half a percent, which is very, very low. Um, now, in regard to uh, animal disease, it's very rare to get any, any animal disease on native, native grassland. The metabolic disease really very rarely happen. Um, again, because if, and this can be, this can be the same in, in a really mixed pasture of 10 to 20 or 30 species in a pasture. But in a good grassland, you've got a lot of species in there. Um, we, we, know, we know, we're told all the time ourselves about um, human health, about how we need to eat a mixed and diverse diet. But we feed our, our sheep one or two plants and wonder why they get sick, or our old cows, one or two plants, wonder why they get sick. Um, they need diversity as well for anim animal health. So, as, as we do for human health. So yeah, it's interesting, it, as we get our farms functioning well now, grasslands restored, all of our problems seem to go away. They really do. And that's because it's, it's, it's it, Mother Nature is basically balancing everything for us um, and, 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 and start working for us. Most of, the, most of all that I really did was got out of the way and let our Mother Nature fix it for me. I didn't really do anything special at all. Um, so we need to do a bit more of that and get out of the way and, 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 and let Mother Nature work it, do it for us. Yeah, good advice. Now, here's one from Sarah. Would the lack of fire also impact on native grasslands as well as bad management of stock? Yeah. No, it's interesting how tough and resilient these things are. The fire didn't really affect them much at all, although Remember that fire, when I had that fire, there wasn't a lot of, lot of uh, 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 native species here on, on the property at all. I, I didn't have a grassland at that stage. And, and interesting, they'll get off track here. That's why we got burnt out. Like if, if uh, and I tell the Victorians this every time I'm in Victoria doing workshops, the reason Victoria gets burnt out every year, it ha no longer has any summer growing uh, native grasses. So it's dry in the summer, it's, it's, it's not green. The property here is green in the summer um, as it would have been in 1860. Victoria used to be green in the summer. It's not now, it, it, it's just full of introduced uh, winter growing grasses that are dry in the summer. It, it, it's just ready to burn every year. Anyway, got off track. Uh, <laughs> uh, so who else up to before that? Um, what was the question <laughs> about the fire and how you didn't you were saying that you didn't have any native grasslands prior to the fire yeah that's right so the fire actually burnt as it did in, in victoria it burnt all these cool season winter grasses it, it, it didn't the, the the native grasses didn't cause that at all um now because it is uh these grasses are three foot high and green in the summer you'd struggle to get a fire to burn and um uh, it'll burn in the autumn and, and winter, but then it's not as dangerous then. So yeah, the, the, 
there's a lot of advantages in, in uh, um, having a grass stain. Or we can, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be native. It can, as long as it, if our pastures that we grow function like grasslands, it can, it, it, it can have a similar effect. So it doesn't necessarily need to be native, it can be introduced, but we need to have a good mix of species there. It needs to function as a grassland, winter growing and summer growing species and forbs and herbs and all of that in it. Fantastic. Now we've only got a few minutes left. Is there anyone else that's got questions actually? Oh, this is the most questions I've ever had at a webinar. So well done. Um, I've put in a um, feed survey, which we'll also mail out to you. We've got um, Bruce Maynard joining this series on the 5th of December. So the link there, if you haven't already registered. And if you'd like some of this great I Love Farmers giveaways, put your name in the chat and Corey and I'll draw some winners out to uh, send you some I Love Farmers gear. Um, is, is there anyone else? I just found it fascinating. One of my young colleagues has texted me saying this man is so 2050. Um, so it's great to hear that um, people are being really inspired by you. It's not surprising though. Um, Corey, do you have anything else you'd like to add? No, I'm the same as well. I guess one of just my last sort of questions to you, Cole, maybe you said just before um, that you were you received a lot of flack when you were going about doing things differently. And I was just curious to know, like, how did you manage that flack and how did you respond? Interesting. What I did. Um, yes, I, I was covering a, a, a lot of flack. But I avoided. Uh, a lot of it by not telling anyone what I was doing yeah. real early days. And fortunately, Daryl Clough and I, Daryl Clough is a sort of, is a, a neighbour um, who lived a couple of hills away. Uh, and we spent a lot of time working a lot of this stuff out and, and, and communicating together. So uh, that's how between us, we developed a lot of, a lot of this early stuff. Um, and um, but when I started to get, get uh, the message out, people started asking me to talk about this stuff. Farmers in particular were really interested in it. Um, the main flack was coming from uh, uh, the agronomy field and some scientists, not all, some scientists were very, very good. Ecologists were very good because they understand it. all this really is, is about getting, getting things functional, like fixing the, the ecology of, of, of everything. So they really understood it. Um, we need more ecologists in agriculture. We need more women in agriculture as well, which I yeah. often talk about. <laughs> and there's one last question has come up from Hamish. Can you please just call out some native species we should be focusing on? Ah, whatever grows in your area is, 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 is very important. Um, whatever's growing there, uh, is, is depends on where you are. Uh, Whatever's growing there, encourage those to grow. Uh, there's nothing like, uh, nothing better than what wants to grow on in, in your climate and your soil. So encourage the, especially, and, and the form of management I'm talking about, like good grazing management, uh, in particular, will, in, will, will encourage those better quality species. So, yeah, there, there's a lot of different types of seeds you can sow, but encouraging what's on your property is, is the better way to go. Fantastic. Well, that brings us to one o'clock. Perfect timing, everybody. And um, Cole, can't thank you enough. It's really been very interesting, as it always is with you. And um, I'm sh I look forward to getting you back. Actually, with all these questions, I think there's room for a bit. Uh, yeah, some something else with you. Oh, on behalf of Corey, the Regional Land Care Coordinator, and myself, uh, we'd like to thank you for joining us. We will send out a copy of the recording to everybody, um, and it'll be available online. I really appreciate your attendance, and thanks for sharing, Cole. Really appreciate it. Thank you. We've got lots of people interested.